Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ruth Wishart. I'm delighted to be chairing this evening's event. Um, and I should say that as we're a little late starting, we've also got permission to be a little late finishing, so you're not going to be disenfranchised in any way. Now, our guest this evening um, has described himself, among other things, as an erratic Marxist. <laughs> Others have suggested he's more of a rock and roll economist, which makes him rather a nice counterpoint to the usual pinstripe variety. What's also, what's a, not at issue at all, I should say, is that his intellect, his powers of communication, and his experience of trans-global e economics have been much in demand across three continents in various universities. He's had a glittering academic career. But it was as a short-lived period as finance minister in Greece, um, following the Syriza election victory in 2015, which brought him to the attention of a much wider audience. As you know, he resigned that summer in 2015. The Greek electorate, in a special referendum, had voted by a very large majority against the terms of a financial restructuring, which he saw as austerity-laden subservience. But his own government finally accepted the terms dictated by the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the European Commission, or as he puts it in one of his books, it was strangled into submission. He also took issue with the assertion from some quarters that Greece was largely the architect of its own misfortune. So you may find the following quote from his memoir, Adults in the Room, rather pertinent tonight. Even if God and all the angels were to invade the soul of every Greek tax evader, turning us into a nation of parsimonious Presbyterian Scots... <laughs> Our incomes were too low and our debts too high to reverse the bankruptcy. Uh, as you can see, Parson William, <laughs> in abundance tonight. Uh, his unrepentant view is that the period following the crash of 10 years ago has been instrumental in the encouragement of the emergence of a number of very unsavoury far-right parties and movements. But his contention is that the crisis in capitalism and the fissures in the European Union can only be tackled from within, and that's one of the reasons that he campaigned against Brexit. He's far from finished with politics, however, ladies and gentlemen, um, having launched the Democracy in Europe movement 2025, two years ago, and earlier this year, his own political party, which roughly translates as European Realistic Disobedience Front. Greece and Europe, you've been warned. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcome one of the most original minds on the world stage, Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you so much, Ruth. When you mentioned my short-lived something, I thought you were going to refer to the fact that I spent a year and a half or so in, in Glasgow, teaching the at the University the of Glasgow. Republic but it was Glasgow, my yes. ministerial career that you were referring to. <laughs> the good people of the Edinburgh Book Festival who invited me here, uh, Nick, where are you? You're somewhere here. Uh, had the idea of uh, uh, creating this uh, series of four events under the provocative title, Killing Democracy, and labeled this particular event today, Reviving Democracy, or something of the sort. Let me see, I've got it right. Giving Democracy a New Life, same thing. Uh, so I won't talk about my books. I'll talk about democracy. Because I think that is a word, which, by the way, it's Greek, as you know. Uh, all good and terrible things come from Greece. Yeah. <laughs> Catastrophe. Tragedy, drama, democracy, um, with a penchant for uh, the best and the worst, like the Scots, I think. Yeah? <laughs> um, but I think it binds us together because, thankfully, we have all coalesced with all our differences and idiosyncrasies. Uh, around the idea of democracy as something that is good and wholesome and worth fighting for. Now, it is important, nevertheless, to recognize that democracy is the most fragile of flowers. Uh, it is hardly ever present in our societies, especially those that call themselves democratic. 
But nevertheless, it is an extremely worthy aim to find ways of keeping the dream of a democratic uh, process and the democratic polity alive. So allow me to say a few words. I'm just going to stand up here. Um, because, you know, we Greeks, we have to talk with our hands, like the Italians. A few words about my understanding of democracy. Because, like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. A very quick comparison between the old idea of democracy that uh, survived in ancient Athens for a few decades and what we consider to be liberal democracy today. It is interesting, is it not, that in ancient Athens, for the few decades during which democracy was uh, alive, uh, despite the very severe drawbacks of, uh, and, and, and demerits of ancient Athenian democracy, the fact that the migrants did not have the vote, the women did not have the vote, the slaves were not even considered to be humans. But nevertheless, it was very interesting, was it not, that it was the first time, and probably the last, in the history of the world, when, according to Aristotle, you had a regime, that's how Aristotle defined democracy, where the power rested with the poor, because the poor were, by definition, the majority. And it was indeed the case in the uh, ancient Athenian assembly that the poor citizens had the majority. And there was the additional concept that aided and abetted democracy, a Greek word which you probably don't know of, unless you are classicists, isigoria, which I'll just tell you what it meant in ancient Greek terms. And that is an interesting juxtaposition with our liberal democracy today. The idea that in the assembly, opinions and views should be judged on their merits and not on the basis of who uttered them. So much were they concerned about Isigoria that if you were a good orator, you got ostracized because you were considered to be someone who had the capacity to manipulate the public and because you spoke very nicely, very beautifully, you had a very good turn of phrase, maybe you managed to push ideas that were of lesser quality in a way that dominated. Now, compare and contrast that with the British tradition of democracy, the Western liberal democratic uh, tradition, uh, which of course migrated to the other side of the Atlantic with the Federalist Papers and the American Constitution. That tradition goes back to the Magna Carta. In other words, the whole idea about British, American, and later continental democracy was how to keep the demos out of the decision-making process. If you read the Federalist Papers in the United States, it was all about how to ensure that the demos was consulted in order to feel that they were part of decision-making, but at the same time guaranteeing that they would not be part of the decision-making. In Britain, in the 19th century, you will recall that there was a major tussle between two concepts that today we assume, more or less, that they are com not only compatible, but, but, but perhaps one and the same concept, liberalism and democracy. To be a liberal in the 19th century meant to be an anti-democrat. John Stuart Mill, a thoroughly good person, also one of feminism's first supporters. Nevertheless, was extremely skeptical about the idea that the majority should rule, that the demos should have the kratos, democracy, the state. Indeed, it took a series of financial crises in the second part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, and at least one great war, world war, for the two concepts to become one, and for us today to be speaking as if there was no contradiction about liberal democracy. So when people talk about China today,
critically about the lack of democratic process, and I'm one of them, as a committed Democrat. We are forgetting that the Industrial Revolution, the second Industrial Revolution in this country, was also predicated upon the idea that the demos should not even be consulted except through representatives that would make sure that the riffraff stayed away from the levers of power. You called me an Iraq... No, you, you called me. You didn't you call me anything. Yourself. I called myself an Iraqi Marxist. You're absolutely right. <laughs> you mentioned my m <laughs> reference to myself as an Iraqi Marxist, but I, I also refer to myself as a libertarian Marxist in order to confuse my enemies even more. <laughs> but not just that, but because I do believe in it. And, but let me explain that for, just for a second. Liberal individualism, which is the political philosophy underpinning the British establishment, the Western European establishment, and the American liberal democratic regimes that we've been having now for more than a century. Liberal individualism turns on a strict separation between the individual and the collective. The whole point about seeking legitimacy in the individual has to do with the presupposition that the individual is well-defined outside the collective. You are a sovereign agent, you are a sovereign consumer, in the marketplace, you are a well-defined entity with well-defined preferences, desires, beliefs, and your liberty is um, conceptualized in terms of how well protected you are from the collectivity, from the riffraff, from the state, from the taxman, from the police, from the secret police. Now, that is a very useful way of understanding the individual, but I think that it is very narrow. The ancient Athenians, who had a very different idea about uh, the good life and the democratic polity, they, could, they would never have understood that. So Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, even though they had many differences between them, would never have understood the, if you want, the Scottish Enlightenment tradition of David Hume and Adam Smith th that defines the individual as well-rounded and well-defined independently of the demos, independently of the polis of the city, independently of the community. The ancient Athenians thought that the only way you can understand yourself is by catching your own reflection in the eyes of the other, of the person that you are discussing with. That without the other, without the polis, without the demos, you are a savage. You would never have any idea of what you want and who you are. This is, so this is an interesting juxtaposition. So the, the point I want to make is that there is something profoundly wrong, profoundly misleading about a society that cherishes individual autonomy and individual freedom by juxtaposing it against the collective. And if you want, now I'll speak as an economist, just for a very, very, very short space of time. I promise. Take the market and the state. We live in a society, don't we, that takes it for granted that there is something like the state, which is defined as the absence of market, and something like the market, which is defined as the free flow of demand and supply, as Adam Smith would have said, um, independently of the state. And yet, this is not the world we live in. The world we live in is one in which there is and great intertwining between markets and states. There would be no marketplace, there would be no market society in Britain if we didn't have the enclosures. And we would never have the, had the enclosures if there was no state to ensure that the peasants, the riffraff, were expelled from the lands. The two were always symbiotic, especially today. The European Union was created as a great cartel. The first name for the European Union was the European Communities of Coal and Steel. It was a cartel to make sure there would be no cooperation, no cooperation, what am I saying? No competition between 
the producers of steel from Belgium, from Germany, from Italy, from France. The whole point of the European Union was to stop market forces from pushing prices down. Yeah? Now, um, a parsimonious Scott or uh, an Adam Smith, laissez-faire, uh, free market capitalist or liberal would say, ah, this is why we're getting out of the EU, because they created it as a great cartel. Yes, but what is going on in this country? What's going on in the United States? Do you think we live in a, in a realm of competitive markets? No, we don't. We live in a world where most prices are fixed. And they are fixed by collusion between planning systems. If you ever go into the Google campus in California, what you are going to encounter is a small, very efficient, and quite pretty Soviet Union. <laughs> there are no markets in there. What there is is a strictly hierarchical company that has created a whole space where people actually live, breathe, exercise, do yoga, uh, create uh, products. There is no market. Nobody pays for anything. You go in there, you eat, you drink. And it's a whole community, self-contained community. Uh, Goldman Sachs. Is there a market in Goldman Sachs? No. It operates like the Politburo, the Central Committee, and the KGB. Anybody who's worked for Goldman Sachs will confirm that. <laughs> they are proud of it in the same way Vladimir Putin is proud of the FSB and the KGB. But there is no market space there. There is no liberal individualism in ExxonMobil or in you know, General Motors, yeah? or in Facebook, for that matter. We live in a world which has presented itself as liberal democratic, failing to conceptualize the fact that liberalism and democracy have traditionally been foes, and would like to think of itself as a market society when our societies have markets. But in the end, we live in a series of planning systems that are clashing and cooperating with one another. Systems that are utterly financialized. Did anybody come here to Edinburgh by train? Did you book online? You, ah, did somebody book online? Yeah, you paid 75p for that. That went to train line, right? Which is owned by another five shell companies. Your 75p traveled at approximately 22 times between London and uh, the Isle of Man and Jersey and then Luxembourg, before ending up with a company called KKR in the United States, uh, where it merged into financial flows of similar tiny little payments and larger payments in a techno structure that has nothing to do with the marketplace, which no state controls, and yet which is aided and abetted by state legislation that your members of parliament vote for without realizing that they're doing it. So what kind of space is there for democracy in this kind of techno-structure. A techno-structure that has four manufacturing processes happening at once. One is a process that manufactures prices. I remember reading a book by John Kenneth Galbraith, the great American liberal economist, uh, who it, during the war was given the job by Franklin Roosevelt to fix prices during the war economy. Prices were fixed during the war, in Britain, in the United States. And he said, he says somewhere in his memoirs, he says, it was fascinating to realize how easy it is to fix prices when they are already fixed between the conglomerates. <laughs> so, manufacturing prices, manufacturing desires, we all love to think that we buy that which we love and we love that which we buy. But this is not, strictly speaking, true, even if it is because there is a process of manufacturing our desires. It's called marketing. It's the paraphernalia of processes that instruct us as to what we actually like, uh, even before we like it. Thirdly, a process that manufactures money. If you knew how money was created by the banks, you would be up in arms. The fact is that money is conjured up from thin air. It is not true that when you get a mortgage, the banker 
is using savings of other people to give it to you. What happens is the banker is actually typing into your bank account a certain amount of money, and it is, it's the black magic of, of finance. 97% of pounds and pence in this country were created by private finance. When in 2008 this whole techno structure came out, came down, you know that uh, the bankers around Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States effectively found themselves owing to one another and to others 50 times the gross national product of the West. Okay. So there's a lot of manufacturing going on, prices, desires, money, and of course, consent. And that, that's how we come to the world of the media and to the world of fashioning a certain set of ideas that the KGB during the Soviet Union, those of who are still alive, like Putin, must be really kicking themselves. Because they, those former KGB agents who had tortured people, who had sent people to the Gulag, are now looking at the West thinking, my goodness, we didn't have to do any of that. We could manufacture, manufacture consent in ways that were a lot more anodyne, a lot more humanistic, without any violence. This technostructure came tumbling down in 2008 under the weight of its own hubris. The world we live in today cannot be made sense of in terms that were conventional wisdom before 2008. That has only happened, happened once before, in 1929. After the crash of 1929, the world did no, long, no longer made sense. After 1929, by means of the conventional wisdom of the 1920s. Similar to today, the crisis of 2008 is still with us. Greece is an example of a place that was completely crushed through a combination of the inanity of its own ruling class, our own ruling class, and the faulty design of the European monetary architecture. But Greece is simply the canary in the mine. It should really not matter in Scotland, it should not matter in the United States, it should not matter anywhere. The only reason why we're discussing it is because we have not fixed capitalism after 2008, because capitalism cannot be fixed, at least not to go back to where it was before 2008. So allow me to finish with a dream. If I am right, and this is something we're going to discuss, that 2008 was our generation's 1927. Then today we live in our generation's postmodern 1930s. Just look around you. We have a nationalist, neo fascist international that is rising up everywhere. It is led by Donald Trump in the United States of America. In Europe, he has very able handmaidens in Matteo Salvini, the deputy prime minister in Italy. We have an interior and police minister in Austria, you know, of all places in Austria, that comes from a party that was founded as a fascist party. We have Orban in Hungary, we have the Polish illiberal democratic regime, <laughs> whatever that means. We have a France that is celebrating the fact that the fascists only got 36% of the vote in the last presidential election, only 36%. We have Britain, that is caught up in a polarizing debate going nowhere about Brexit and preventing us from having a sensible liberal discussion regarding the interests of the peoples of this nation, of this country. So the dream is that we have a new deal like that which Franklin Roosevelt introduced in 1933, but at a global scale, an internationalist new deal involving progressive movements in this country, in the United States, in Mexico, with the new president that they have now elected, in continental Europe, this is why our movement, DiEM25, will be running in the European Parliament elections in order to introduce what we call a new deal for Europe, is our agenda 
for what to do with the four crises that are tearing our societies apart. Private debt, public debt, poverty, and incredibly low levels of investment in the things that humanity needs and the planet needs. So my dream would be that we have a progressive international opposing simultaneously the inane establishment that is reminding me increasingly of the Weimar Republic, Republic as it was crumbling in the late 1920s, and the nationalist neo-fascist international. I thought we should end with a dream. I'd like to start, maybe, Anis, with putting, with you putting a bit more flesh in, in that dream of uh, what you want for DiEM 2025. I noticed in your book you said, um, adding to the, the, the original French dreams of liberty, equality, and fraternity, you've said that um, uh, the new Europe should consist of somewhere where no European nation can be free as long as another's democracy is violated. No European nation can live in dignity so long as another is denied it. And no European can hope for prosperity if another is pushed into permanent insolvency and depression. Nobody could quibble with that, but how is it going to come about? The way we are trying to make it come about, is leading by example, we're not, DiEM25 is not going to change the world on its own. Uh, we're a young movement of about 120,000 people across Europe. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to demonstrate not that another Europe is possible, but that another Europe is already here. And how do we do this? Let me give you an example. Uh, when last year, uh, Matteo Renzi, the then Italian Prime Minister, called for a referendum for constitutional reform in inverted, inverted commas, we decided to do something that have, had never happened before in Europe. We decided what our position would be in Italy at the pan-European level. So we started a boisterous debate amongst members of DiEM25 here in Edinburgh as well, in Greece, in Italy, in Germany. Of course, our Italian friends and comrades and colleagues were the first ones that led the debate. But the Germans, the French, the Polish, the Danish participated in this debate. And then we had a pan-European vote across members of DiEM25 on what our position on Italy is. So that is how the transnationality ball started rolling. So now we have a new party in Greece, Mera25, which is part of the DiEM network. Our manifesto, with which we're going to run in the general election that is coming up in the next few months, we don't know exactly when, is going to be voted for by all our members, including our members in Scotland. Now, this is how we demonstrate that it is possible to have local action, patriotic parties, but at the same time operate on the basis of Selecting policies and positions in Greece that resonate with what's happening in Scotland, with what's happening in Italy. Because, look, let's face it, the four crises that I mentioned, public, public debt, private debt, poverty, and low level of investment in the things we need, they're a little, a little bit like the problems of climate change. Climate change requires of each one of us that we change our ways. But it's not enough for you and me to change our ways. It's not enough for Scotland to change its ways. So you need local action and global action, internationalism. So these four crises need this. So this is, this is what we mean. You see, the tragedy of the crisis of 2008 was that by the time it reached Europe, which was a year, a year and a half later, and it first erupted in Greece, then went to Ireland, then went to Portugal, then went to Spain, Italy, and then it migrated all over the place. The tragedy was that the establishment that had actually caused, through its inanity and authoritarianism, that crisis, in cahoots with the financial sector, in order to justify the bailouts for themselves and for their mates, started turning one proud nation against the other, the Germans were told that the cause of the problem were the Greeks. The Greeks reacted in a knee-jerk reaction by hating the Germans. It's not easy to, uh, to do this, but it can be done. <laughs> if you know what I mean, after having a Nazi occupation in the 1940s. I was despairing watching these ancient, supposedly, hatreds being revived uh, in order to cover up the real causes of the, of the crisis, 
to cover up the fact that the crisis happened because we had an unholy alliance between the grasshoppers of the north and the grasshoppers of the south against the ants of the north and the ants of the south. So the, what we're really desperately trying to do, I think we should continue to do it, uh, across Europe and indeed across the world, is create an alliance of ants, of those who actually do the work and who are constantly the victims of the, alliance, the unholy alliance of the grasshoppers. And there's, a, there's a kind of profound irony at the heart of all this, though, because you're, you're mounting this challenge, this democratic challenge, if I could use that unfortunate adjective. You're mounting this challenge at a time when Europe, and certainly from a British perspective, is completely um, obsessed about Brexit and the fallout from Brexit. And ironically, as I say, Britain has actually caused the other 27 nations to coalesce. I don't think that Britain caused the other 27 nations to coalesce. What Brexit did was to cause the ruling classes of the other 27 nations to coalesce. Not, let's not confuse the, the ruling class of a country with its people. If you look at the people of Italy, if you look at the people of Greece, if you look at the people of Germany, huh, they are still Europeanists. They like the idea of a united Europe. But if you ask them, do you trust the European Union institutions, you get an 85% no. So Brexit has not changed that. Uh, the European Union is at an advanced stage of disintegration. It is disintegrating everywhere. Uh, and you have this uh, remarkable uh, sight. The more the disintegration proceeds, like the rot that, con that, that goes deeper and deeper, the more united the regime looks. But remember the Soviet Union in the 1980s? The Politburo looked rock solid. You know, the party was more united than ever. And then it collapsed. Because the more you keep an unsustainable political economy together, by force, on the basis of unsustainable, um, unsustainable policies, on the basis of fear, the fear that they tried to inspire in the Greek people in 2015, in the summer, uh, the more you succeed in doing it. But all you're doing is you're postponing the, the crumbling, yeah. and when the crumbling comes, it is very fast, very furious, and very uncontrollable, just like 2008 was in the financial markets. So it's a very specific kind of crumbling you're looking for, isn't it? Because you, you make a powerful case for, in terms of Brexit, of, of staying in Europe and fighting Europe from within, but you're obviously talking about two different kinds of Europe. You want one bit of Europe to crumble and be no longer relevant, i.e. the ruling classes, as you could characterise them, but you want a kind of pan-European movement to rise up in its place? I put it, um, allow me to put it a little bit more simply, in the sense that as a Greek patriot, I always criticized my government when it was wrong, because that's what patriots must do, and my government was usually wrong, not the government I served in, every government. <laughs> yeah? And I'm sure you've had this experience in this country, uh, but you're criticizing your government because you're a patriot. You do not want to bring down your country. You do not want to disintegrate your country. So my argument was always about the European Union. It was put together as an oligarchy. There is no doubt about that. But how was the British state put together? As a what? A democracy? It was one of the most vile oligarchies in the history of the world. Yeah? Just like our one in Greece and the French one uh, and the Russian one. Uh, but what do we do? We storm the castle, not in order to demolish it, but in, to, in order to put it into the service of the many, not the few, as Jeremy would have said. It's, yes, I was just going to say that doesn't sound entirely original. However, <laughs> before I open it up to um, uh, the audience here, I, I listened to you last uh, yesterday with Shami Chakrabarti, and um, I've heard you in various bits of your writing, talking about the media. And how can I put this in not exactly flattering terms? And I want to just, um, I want just to throw in a quote about your own Greek media, though I know that you're equally hostile to media wherever. Not equally. Oh. They're not all equally bad. They're but they, bad, but, but they're not all equally bad. bad. Yes, yeah, but we're, we're agreed that you think they're all bad. Except the BBC, of course, which is here today. <laughs> Only mm. joking. Which bit is the joke? I think they know. <laughs> OK, let me, let me just throw in this quote before we, before we go to the audience about the Greek media. Um, and this is, you know, this is a kind of low-key 
um, statement of, of Yanis is, the triangle of sin was complete. The insolvent media were kept in a zombified condition by the zombie banks, which were maintained in their undead condition by a bankrupt government. I mean, you spend so much time on the fence in these books. <laughs> I'm not being paid sufficiently to keep my mouth shut. And it's working, yeah. <laughs> Seriously. No, look, it's, it, it, the, 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 you have to realize that Greece is a special case. It's a case where the ruling class went bankrupt. Uh, the overborrowing that had kept them afloat up until 2008 just collapsed in exactly the same way that the financial sectors and the grasshoppers in the city of London, in Wall Street, in Frankfurt, in Paris, and so collapsed. The difference was that in this country, you had the Bank of England printing money as if there was no tomorrow to refloat them, similarly in the United States, uh, similarly in, uh, in Germany, Angela Merkel, for goodness sake. Uh, one, one morning, she received a phone call. She nearly had a heart attack. Uh, somebody said to her, from the chancellery or the Ministry of Finance, I'm not sure where it was, uh, we need to give our bankers 600 billion euros today. She said, what? These people are, 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 you know, are making zillions. Why do they want 600 billion from the taxpayer? No, 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 um, Chancellor, they're all bankrupt. It happened overnight. She had, she had no idea why it happened, but of course, you know, she, she signed on the dotted line. Okay. So, the difference was that in Greece, we didn't have a central bank. And we did not have the surpluses that German, the German state had, has been uh, accumulating as a result of a mercantilism which for years has been uh, amassing uh, trade surpluses with the United States, with Britain, and so on and so forth. So our ol oligarchy, well, but of course, the international financiers and the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank and the European Commission came to the rescue. They didn't come to rescue the Greek oligarchs. They didn't care about the Greek oligarchs they came to rescue Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, the French and the German banks, because the Greek state and the Greek oligarchy together had borrowed huge amounts of money from the German and the French banks at a time when every... Remember the, the charming notion of riskless risk? Remember somebody called Gordon Brown once said, we have overcome the, 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 the dynamic of boom and bust. <laughs> or Bern Bernanke, the chairman of the Fed, who said, we live in a great moderation. That was all before 2008, my goodness. The most immoderate period in human history was, uh, and the most unparsimonious period in human history was pre presented as moderate. Anyway, so they all came down. And in the process of saving Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, and so on, they saved the Greek bankers as well. Yeah? Uh, and of course, they shifted all those losses onto the shoulders of the the weakest shoulders of the weakest taxpayers. Initially the Greeks, the Slovaks, the Italians, then eventually the Germans. Um, so in the process, what you had is, it's what I just described in the quotation that you so kindly read out from. Um, you had the oligarchs, the developers, that had been making a fortune out of uh, contracts they got from the state that was borrowing the money from Deutsche Bank. The same oligarchs owned the media, uh, and use them in order to exercise political power to manufacture consent in Greece for the oligarchy regime. Once they got bankrupt, the media were profoundly insolvent. Not a single television channel, not a single radio station, not a single newspaper um, is in the black. They're all deeply in the red, if it's not purple. Huh? Um, and they were kept going through Advertising placed in those media, lucrative advertising, you know, just ridiculous sums of money being paid to them to keep them afloat by the bankers who were bankrupt, who were saved by the International Monetary Fund, the European Union, the European Central Bank, with loans that they were, of course, unloading onto the shoulders of the weakest of taxpayers. Did you expect those media to be kind to politicians like myself? who advocated the end of this triangle of sin, it would be just, you know... Biting the hand that fed them. Worse than that, it, it, it would require a degree of heroism amongst these people that I think would be inhuman to expect. Okay, now I want to, I want to let the audience in, but I just should say that this, these books um, are 
I mean, I was quite panicky about meeting this man, because, as most of you will know, uh, economics is not my core skill. But this book is actually an absolutely cracking read, but there's, uh, all of his books are littered with wonderful quotes, and I particularly liked the one that you threw in from Catherine the Great, which said, you're talking about Greece, and you said, uh, if you can't be a good example, then you just have to be a horrible warning. That we are. <laughs> so let's, we are. Um, let's have the lights up, and we, there are four microphones, um, so... Everybody should get a chance. There's a, a one up there. Well done, yes, there. And let's get a mic to somebody else there. There, thank you. Right, please. Oh, um, you Where are you? Stand up. Here. Stand up so I can see you. I'll stand up too. So, <laughs> so you were talking about ants and grasshoppers. And in our current political system, what happens is the establishment run the political parties for the most part. There are exceptions. Thank you, Jeremy. But... There are, um, that's an issue because the parties just keep becoming more and more neoliberal and buying into the whole process because they've achieved power and they want to maintain that power. So would it not be an idea to go back to what you were talking about, about the idea of ancient Athens and having 50% of your government to be ordinary citizens so that each constituency elected a party, political party member, and an ordinary member of the public, and then your, um, your government will always have, your parliament will always have 50% ordinary people and a smaller percentage of each party. You just reminded me that in ancient Athens, there was a mighty clash, philosophical, political, moral clash between the aristocrats and the democrats. What is fascinating is to recall that the aristocrats were in favor of elections, and the democrats were dead set against elections. Because the democrats used to think, and I think quite correctly, that it is always the richer who have the rhetorical skills, the money, the time, and the opportunity to invest in political power and political persuasion, and therefore they will be the ones who get elected in the end, even though back then they didn't have you know, Facebook and uh, advertising on television and so on. Uh, and so the question is, OK, so what do the Democrats suggest instead of elections? And the answer is lotteries. Every single position in government in ancient Athens was determined by lot, including the judges, except two positions. The general, who had to know something about fighting an army, uh, a war, and the banker, the central banker, who was always a slave. You know why? because citizens could not be flogged. I think we should bring this back. <laughs> We've got, so, could we get another mic to, to... And the gentleman... That gentleman, and then there's a gentleman behind as well. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I was surprised to read uh, a couple of years ago that uh, in spite of America printing, I think at that stage, two and a half, three trillion dollars or, or creating money, quantitative... About 15 to 16. Um, whatever the m number was then, uh, American public debt had doubled. And I wondered how that was. And then if you look at the public debt in Japan, uh, China, uh, Australia, wherever you look, uh, it's been increasing. And where is the money coming from? Okay, well, let's first get one thing straight. We do not have a crisis of public debt. The crisis of 2008 was presented as a crisis of government by those who wanted to hide the fact that it was a, a crisis of private debt, of the private financial institutions that were then salvaged by <laughs> plundering through austerity taxpayers while at the same time printing money. Let me ask tec the technical part of your question. Where, you know, how can you have all these quadrillions of, of debt? The answer is, there is a lot of private wealth around. If I were to give you today um, 300 billion quid, let's say, you know, I became over generous all, all, all of a sudden. <laughs> I, I gave you 300 uh, billion, what would you do with it? you'd have a serious problem. Firstly, you can't take it home in a bag. It's too large. It just can't be done. You don't have a large enough house. And, huh? 
what do you do with it? You have to invest it. Now, in what? During a crisis, even if you build new factories to produce new gadgets and whatever, you are not going to have enough, there won't be enough customers ready and willing, and with the money, to purchase the gadgets that you will be producing. So you freeze, you think, I'm not going to invest because there won't be aggregate demand for the gadgets that I will be producing. You do not invest, there isn't enough aggregate demand because there aren't enough jobs, because people like you have not invested, and then you, see, you say to yourself, ah, you see, I was right. <laughs> yeah? But you are still stuck with the problem, what do you do with the billions? So you buy government debt. Let me tell you something that I think is quite indicative of what I say in my other book, the book that I've written about my, to, to, talking to my daughter about the economy. I think it's very interesting to take the case of Singapore. The state of Singapore, in its constitution, bans deficits. The government of Singapore has never had a deficit in its history. Do you know that its debt is 120% its GDP? How is it possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. They are smart people. Lee Kuan Yew and then his, uh, the people, his, his followers understood that the only way capitalism could, can work is if you create public debt, because public debt is for the banks, the private banks, what oil is to an engine. So what they did was, every year they borrow money and they use it to buy assets to invest on behalf of the state of Singapore. So even though the government never overspends, their taxes pay for pensions, for um, you know, whatever government expenditure there is, the government constantly borrows from private individuals in order to invest so as to produce the bonds, the public debt, that is the oil that keeps the machinery of capitalism going. So let's not allow those who caused the crisis, private financiers on the basis of private debt, to bamboozle us into a discussion about public debt, which then is the excuse for austerity, which is the worst thing you can do during a period of stagnation and crisis. Now, <laughs> we've got a lady there, and then there's a, there's a seat gentleman just in the middle there. If we could get the other mic to him, and then somebody, somebody over here. Thank you. Hello, uh, Yanis. I think there's more. The, it's more than the financial system that's corrupt. Do you not believe the whole system of energy is corrupt? Of Shale energy. Oil, my energy. Yeah. I mean, money at the end of the day is just made up. Energy, oil, fossil fuels. That is the ability to do work. And I just worry. I read some figures about the shale oil mining industry. All the companies doing shale oil and gas mining in the states. They're all up to their ears in debt. I just feel there is more than financial debt out there in the world, and I think it has to be part of the change that we come to, because you can't just promise people things that the energy system can't possibly deliver. So I just wanted to bring energy into that. You should, because the oil curse is a very real phenomenon. With the exception of Norway, every country that discovered oil suffered for it, including the United Kingdom. Thatcher financed the attack on the working class and the communities in this country using North Sea oil until it was depleted. <laughs> Wherever, take a country like Nigeria, yeah? you have immense wealth, you have immense poverty, and you have immense authoritarianism as a result of the oil curse. Now, the oil curse always goes hand in hand with what I call the finance curse. And what is the finance curse? The other side of the oil curse, in the sense that, what is it that gives a Saudi Arabian prince, sheikh or whatever, immense power? The fact that he happens to own the well, the piece of land with oil underneath. In David Ricardo's terms, the English um, early uh, 19th century political economist who defined the concept of rent, this is a major impediment even to capitalist growth. You see, Ricardo and Adam Smith, the Scotsman, had this disagreement. I mean, Smith was dead by then, but Ricardo had a disagreement with a dead Smith. <laughs> and Smith was an optimist. He believed that 
Free market capitalism would be like an escalator that takes all of us up constantly. Some of us are on a higher step than others. Uh, but if you let the market do, perform its miracle, we'll all keep going up, and maybe the steps would start coming together with reduced inequality. He was an optimist. David Ricardo, who was a, a great supporter of Adam Smith's way of thinking, spotted a difficulty in Smith's model of capitalism. And the difficulty was the private ownership of scarce land and scarce resources. Because his point was, and it was an apt point, that as the escalator of Adam Smith is going up, and there is growth, and there are more jobs, and there is more income, more and more of it is going to be concentrating in the hands of those who own, by accident of history, or through authoritarianism, the scarce land resources, whether this soil for agricultural purposes, or shale gas in Texas, or some oil rig somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Yeah? And he felt that as the percentage of the total wealth is constantly appropriated increasingly by the few, that would be bad for capitalists. So he was not a communist, he was not a socialist. He was worried about capitalists, as opposed to the landowners, the ones who own the oil wells and so on. Now, if you add to that the black magic of finance, which conjures up from thin air gigantic mountain ranges of paper money, and then combine this with the accumulating value in the hands of those who own the scarce resources, you end up with a confluence of forces that can only lead to something like 2008. And oh. not to mention the fact that we're destroying the planet in the process. Could you try and get two more in? There's a lady somewhere up here with the mic, and then there's a gentleman in the middle there with the mic. So we'll just start off here, if we may. My question's really a bit basic. Nothing can you, like can you stand up? I want to see you. And could you hold the mic up against you? Yeah. M my question's really much more simple than everybody else's. Why is it now that the majority um, it, it, in any kind of election and, and referendum um, is no longer respected. You know, you had the Scottish independence referendum and they, the independence movement had more money than the other movement and they did 10% difference and they're still complaining, moaning, whining, wanting another referendum. The European election, the European referendum was won by whichever camp, Brexit, and the people who lost that are still cantering up and down Whitehall, complaining, whining, minging, moaning. Trump is, mind you, Trump is a little bit different. Trump is, is elected in America, and the minority won't accept the result of a democratic election. Why? Well, I'm going to go against the grain of the audience and, 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 and sympathize with you. Just for a bit, <laughs> to begin with, yeah? Because, as Ruth said, and as many of you know, it was on the night of the 5th of July 2015 when the very brave and courageous people of Greece gave us a 62% rejection of the Troika's ultimatum, of the Kretos ultimatum, and that very night my Prime Minister turned around and said, oh, we need to surrender, and we need to betray the 62%. So I am, as a Democrat, as a committed Democrat, I think it's imperative for each one of us, to the extent that we are committed Democrats, to respect, respect the, the verdict of the referenda and of elections. Respecting the verdict does not mean agreeing with it. It does, mean, it does not mean that I'm going to give up my attempt to change your mind and to bring you onto my side but you have to be respected. What the European Union did to the Irish people after the referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, which is to say you gave us the wrong verdict, keep voting until you get it right, is not something I would like to see in this country. I supported uh, Remain. I campaigned vociferously against Brexit, but I reject the notion that there must be a second referendum because the people who voted to leave um, were lesser um, intellectuals than the rest of us who supported the Remain. So, th so far, we are on the same page. I will even say that the spectacle of Democrats, especially Hillary Clinton supporters in the United States, demonizing and vilifying those who voted for Trump and blaming it on, on Vladimir Putin or Facebook, 
is a sign that the Democratic Party in the United States has completely lost its way. They have not understood that the people who voted for Trump, firstly, a very large section of them had voted for Obama in 2008. So you can't say that they were racist, yeah? unless they changed the, the spots between 2008 and 2016. But I don't believe that. If you really want to understand, well, how I, I'll tell you how I understand Trump's election. For the first time in the last 90 years, a majority of American families cannot afford to buy the cheapest car on the market. In America, without a car, you don't exist. You can't find a job, you can't go to the supermarket, you can't do anything, except for those who live in Manhattan. Yeah? And for the first time in 90 years, the majority of families cannot afford the cheapest car, which is a Nissan, I believe, trading at around 14,000 American dollars. And when I say they can't afford it, I don't say that they don't have the money. They don't even have the credit worthiness to get a bank loan to buy one. That's why Trump won. This is why the fascists win. Because they go to the population and they say to them, we will give you back your dignity. They don't say, I'm going to be a horrible person, I'm going to create a concentration camp. They do it in the end. But what they promise people is that they will restore their pride, their dignity, their country. And we progressives who want to fight them must never turn against those who vote for the right, must never say to them, ah, your vote doesn't count, we must respect, respect every single citizen, including those who vote for vile candidates and vile causes, and we have to win them over. This is something that we have to, re to recover as a principle amongst progressives. I'm, I'm... Just a, just a second, because I also have a dream, and that's that you can ask a single sentence question and you can answer it in 30 seconds. I've got one. Yanis, you spoke very, uh, a lot about uh, Europe and America, yet there's a big world out there which encompasses Asia and Africa and Latin America. And not very recent in the past, a democracy was used as, a, as, a, as an excuse to implement the capitalistic agenda of some of the conglomerates. Or in some of the economies, it was very heavily emphasized on the, on the Soviet model. So what do you think in the, in the, in the in your perfect world, the perfect balance interplay between democracy and capitalism? In 30 seconds? Please. Democracy has always been used in the last decades as a bulwark by which to demolish on a colonial agenda uh, weaker people, peoples and weaker nations. Think of Iraq. On the basis of a campaign to bring democracy to Iraq, we just destroyed a whole part of the globe. Yeah? We, the West, I mean. But that is not a reason to lose sight of the great potential for liberating and for pushing in a progressive direction humanity in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, on the basis of a democratizing process. Thank you. Um, Could it, um, I will ask you to thank Yanis properly in a second, but I, I just want to say a couple of things about the books. Adults in the Room is, is a memoir which tells the, the whole story in, in, in gothic detail of, of all the negotiations that he had to go through with the, the, the Troika as they became known. Um, and the weak suffer what they must does exactly what it says in the tin and, and explains how it's always the disenfranchised who wind up picking up the tab for the people who made them broke in the first place. There's a third book, um, Talking to My Daughter, which uh, uh, the subtitle isn't Capitalism for Dummies, but that's how I found it. It was, it was a really useful primer for me. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that because um, Yanis has already sold so many books this week, there's a limited number of them to be signed in the signing tent, but there are bookmarks to be signed in the signing tent. We don't believe in the market, so we're not selling them. <laughs> we do believe in the market, and we are selling them. And... <laughs> and uh, there are bookmarks to be signed, and, and the good news is um, that there's another, whatever they come in, another van load of, of <laughs> Yanis' books arriving tomorrow. So if you wanted to pop back and get the books, you can do that, but you can also have a chat to him tonight and get bookmarks signed. Meanwhile, I'm sure you've been as riveted as I've been. Please join me in thanking Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you.